group assignment. On the back of that assignment, can I just turn that on? On the back of that assignment, there was um, a cladogram. And this cladogram is the cladogram of the animal phyla. And so um, when we look at this diagram, you'll see that the ancestor to all of the animals was a colonial flagellate. And we're going to talk about what that is, but that is a single celled organism that lives as a colony. And then we have the evolution of the sponges, which are in porifera. Then we're going to talk about the cnidarians. And then you'll notice that in each of these branches, there is a distinguishing characteristic. And so for these distinguishing characteristics, this will be what is in that lecture that is online. So I talked about the evolution of bilateral symmetry and what that means, the significance of it. And then this idea of being a deuterostome versus a protostome actually has to do with embryonic development. But something really weird happens when you look at this. I think it's kind of strange. So if you think about all of the animals that we have that are not vertebrates, um, when you think about what we might be closely related to, well, I would like to think that we'd be closely related to a pretty intelligent um, group of organisms. So maybe the mollusks, right? Because the mollusks include the squid and the octopus and the, um, um, also the, oh, what is that called? Squid octopus, there's one more. Anyway, so those are pretty intelligent organisms, right? But if we look at who we are most closely related to on this cladogram, we are re related to the sea stars, okay? So I don't think of sea stars as being very intelligent, um, but when we look at our embryonic development, it is most similar to the embryonic development seen in sea stars. So we are an example, our phylum is the phylum chordata, and then echinodermar, Kinodermata includes the sea stars, the sea cucumbers, the sea urchins, um, and all those organisms that actually have radial symmetry. So radial symmetry kind of reappears here in the adult echinoderms. Okay. Now this particular um, cladogram is actually based um, a lot on molecular data. And so when we look at the molecular data, we see that the earthworms, are more distantly related to the arthropods than they are to the roundworms. So the roundworms and the arthropods, and this is actually based upon um, data looking at the DNA. So looking at the molecular data. When I was learning my cladogram, when I was in school, the arthropods, which are segmented, are, were actually grouped with the annelids, which are also segmented. But it appears that segmentation um, evolved twice here so that we see it arising separately in the arthropods and the annelids because the nematodes don't. So ichthyosoa, we'll talk about this later, this actually has to do with an exoskeleton and when they undergo shedding or molting of their exoskeleton, they actually go through a process called ichthyosis and ichthyosis is where they come out of the exoskeleton to, in order to grow. Okay. So this is kind of an overview of what we're gonna be doing for the next few weeks. So we're gonna be talking about each group and we're actually going to, um, in a few minutes, we're gonna begin with the porifera. But before we do that, I wanted to talk about some interesting, um, let's just get through that. Okay. Some interesting things that have um, happened in the history of life on this planet. So it's believed that the Earth is about 4.5 billion years old. And so at about 3 billion years or 3.5 billion years, we start to see, actually, what is that? That would be actually 1.5 billion, sorry. 1.55 billion years, we see prokaryotes. And what are prokaryotes? What's an example of a prokaryotic organism that is around today? E. coli, bacteria. Right, so these are bacteria. So bacteria were around first, right? Then we get the eukaryotes, karyote, karyote fossils. And so this would be single celled organisms like amoeba, protozoans, right, euglena, right? But we are also made up of uh, eukaryotic cells. So this is actually, this is like 3.5, this is like 1.5 billion years ago. 
And then you'll notice that we then get multicellular organisms arising. And then we start to move on to land. And then we get the evolution of vertebrates, which include, included the dinosaurs. And then this would be after the dinosaurs have gone extinct, we have the mammals. And then right at the very end of here, if we were just looking at 24 hour period, this would be when humans appear, okay? So things have been around for a very, very long time on this planet prior to us arising, arriving on the scene, right? So something really interesting happens about in, in the history of animals at about 540 million years ago. And this is what is called the Cambrian explosion. So this is 540 million years ago. Okay, this is significant increase in the diversity of animals. So hence the explosion. But sometimes when we think about explosion, we think that it happened fast. And fast to us as individuals is completely different from what geologists who study the timeline of the Earth, planet Earth, consider fast. And so this was about, um, occurred, and the timeline was about 40 million years. So that 40 million years is the explosion. Now there would be another term for explosion. And what do you think that term is? In terms of animal diversification, when we talk about how an ancestral finch gave rise to all of the finches that we see on the Galapagos Islands, what is that referred to as? Speciation, but it's also called evolution, but it's also called adaptive radiation. Okay. This is also an example of divergent evolution. So interestingly, something must have happened on the planet, we believe, to cause this rapid diversification of animals. And then subsequently, when we look at the animals, we, we would predict that this has changed the course of, of evolutionary history on the planet, okay? So I'm gonna hand you out a little um, Cambrian explosion uh, worksheet. And I want you to spend a few minutes just answering these questions before watching the video, and then we're gonna watch the video, and then we're gonna answer them again. So if you want to, you can find a partner to answer these questions about the Cambrian era. So if you don't know, it's not a big deal, right? Because we're going to watch the video and it's going to answer these questions. So if you don't know, you can either put a question mark or you can take an educated guess at what you think the answer is. So this is, a way, this is something that you're going to turn in, but this is something that you could use for study purposes. And this is also discussed in your textbook. I believe it's chapter 27 in the textbook. So you don't want to Google the answers. <laughs>
So if you Google the Cambrian explosion, this might be something that you might come up with. And if you go to a rock shop, a mineral shop, oftentimes they have some fossils. And this is kind of a common fossil that you'll see in rock shops. And does anybody know what this is a fossil of? Related. Trilobites. Yes, trilobites. Yes. So trilobites are no longer around today, but you'll notice that they kind of look similar to some of the arthropods, some of the ex the organisms that have exoskeletons, like the um, what did you say the horseshoe crab, right? So they look similar. Okay. When the clock of animal evolution began to turn, life on Earth seemed simple, sedentary, and peaceful. Then in a flash, everything changed. Over 500 million years ago, fantastic creatures sprang into being as though from nowhere. In geologic time, these animals appeared in the blink of an eye. For the evolution of life on our world, it was a singular, defining moment. Des Collins has dedicated his career to the pursuit of these ancient creatures. As a paleontologist, he wants to look back in time. All the way back to more than 500 million years ago. By peering into the darkest recesses of animal history, Collins hopes to shed light on what has long remained a mystery. At Toronto's Royal Ontario Museum, Collins works with a vast repository of fragments from the ancient past. Fragments that reveal a world unknown until recently. They look a much better one over here. There's the, 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 the claw, the large predator. Oh. It shows a much better. Yes. These fossils from high in the Canadian Rockies form pieces in a puzzle that tell the story of early life on Earth. See, that was great, thank you. Okay. The locale they work with is what's called the Burgess Shale. It's, it's a very famous locality. Uh, the one since it was first discovered about 1909. The numbers of fossils are in the tens of, of thousands. The first person that, that collected in the famous locality out west, uh, Western Canada, but on the turn of the century, he collected some like 65,000 specimens in five seasons. Strange, almost unearthly creatures were discovered in the Burgess Shale. They existed over half a billion years ago during the Cambrian period, eight times earlier than the last days of the dinosaurs. But more astonishing than their antiquity was the way these bizarre animals appeared, as if all at once, suddenly coursing through the world's oceans. Evidence of this unique event is not isolated to the Canadian Rockies. Similar sites have been uncovered all over the world. This extraordinary burst of animal life was dubbed the Cambrian Explosion. If we could go back in time, before fish, before complex animals roamed the seas, and before the Cambrian explosion, we would find only simple creatures. The course of life was relatively slow. Sponges, 
flower-like organisms and flatworm-like animals dominated the ocean realm. Then evolution took an abrupt turn. Suddenly, wondrous new life forms filled the watery world. A marine worm called Ashea was remarkably complex and mobile. Survival depended on competition for food, and the ocean became a realm of hunter and hunter. The Cambrian was a time full of sudden danger. Even in such a savage world, Anomalacaris stood out. Nothing matched it for its sheer size and killing efficiency. Snaring its prey with its two powerful front claws, it was a swift and deadly hunter. Only slightly lower in the food chain, another fearsome predator prowled the oceans. Opabinia had five eyes at the top of its head and its own grasping claws to snare the weak and unsuspecting. To counter such ferocious predators, animals adapted new defenses. Canadia, a worm-like creature, sported protective bristles along the length of its body, essential armor for a slow moving beast. Loaxia also glided on the ocean floor, depending on their elongated spikes for protection. What caused this phenomenal eruption of life, and what impact did these fantastic creatures have on Earth? Some of these are magnified times 12, like the swap here. Well, that's fantastic. Look at the translucence of it and uh, all the detail of its appendages. This is the biggest bicade I've ever seen. Well, it's enlarged 12 times. That's 12 times bigger than the life size when it actually worked there. I guess that's right. The life size would have been about two inches long like this. Yeah, not very big. Evolutionary biologist Rudy Rath is obsessed with just these questions. As a leading authority on the Cambrian explosion, he consults with those who seem to make extinct animals come back to life. It would seem likely that there's not a single cause for a unique event like that. But we don't know. It was a unique event in Earth history. And there have been a number of hypotheses that have been put forward, and the hypotheses are good ones, and they include a real diversity of ideas. For example, that there was a genetic revolution that took place. The genetic revolution of the Cambrian period could never have occurred without Earth's first primitive animals, the sponges. They had existed for millions of years, establishing the way cells interact to build an animal. Building on a cellular framework established by sponges, Flower-like cnidarians were the first animals to develop the revolutionary ability to move. Finally, life began to evolve in dramatic new ways with the appearance of flatworm-like animals. This was the first creature to embody the genetic blueprint of a hunter, complete with a head and a primitive brain set near sensory organs. But reaching a critical threshold of genetic complexity was only part of what triggered the Cambrian explosion. Other idea was that animals were evolving, they were small, but something changed ecologically, perhaps the oxygen levels arose. And the result of that was that animals could become larger. The third possibility for why the Cambrian explosion happened is that it was a arms race that some animals learned to become predators and began to eat other animals. And as soon as that happened, of course, now the arms race begins because there's an advantage to avoid being eaten and there's an advantage to eating. So an arms race begins, an arms race that hasn't ended yet in, in the animal kingdom. 
this is still driving evolution even now. And I, I think it's likely, in fact, that all of these uh, explanations probably reflect some part of that truth of, of what happened to make the Cambrian explosion. What may be most astounding about the Cambrian explosion's fossil record is what we can see mirrored. Today, almost every creature on Earth can be traced back to the animals that left these imprints. Even though the species that appeared during the Cambrian explosion are extinct, some animals today bear an uncanny resemblance to them. This was Ashea, a carnivorous worm that first appeared over 500 million years ago. It's almost a double for the modern-day velvet worm, a predatory animal found in damp leaf litter and moist undergrowth of the Australian forests. Of course, nothing remotely resembling an elephant existed 500 million years ago. But the basic blueprints for these magnificent creatures were also being sketched back then. The elephant's basic design, its muscle segments, skeleton, brain and spinal cord, were represented in the tiny pikea. It's hard to imagine a creature any more different from an elephant. Pikea swam the oceans and measured only a few inches. But this ancient body plan would be passed on to fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. Even elephants would descend from this ancient design. One of the amazing things about the animal kingdom, right from the Cambrian on, is that there's only about 35 body plans, basic designs, yet there are millions of species. Millions of species today, millions of species at any slice of time in the past. And they represent everything. Everything from insects to whales, animals that live in the water, animals that burrow underground, animals that live in coral reefs, animals that swim in the ocean, animals that live on the Antarctic ice, all of these species based on these 35 body plans. It was as if nature somehow struck upon life's essential designs in a single evolutionary meaning. Every new shape of life that followed has been a variation of one of these themes. It all began over half a billion years ago when the Earth experienced an explosion of animal life. At first glance, the creatures that emerged seemed alien, almost otherworldly to us. But as we reconstruct these ancient creatures, piecing the puzzle back together, we are amazed at what we find. The ancestors of animals that dominate the world today. Okay, so take a look at your um, sheet. You were following along on there and see if your, any of your answers might change. We'll go over it in a second. And you can talk about it as well. So 
number one, obviously paleontologists do study fossils. So that one was true. Although I didn't know how to spell it last week, right? <laughs> okay, the first organisms that evolved on earth were animals. Is that true or false? False, right? Because we talked about how bacteria came first, right? And we see algae, for example, coming in. Um, the animals that evolved during the Cambrian explosion are the first animals that ever lived on Earth. False. So what lived on Earth before then that were animals? Sponges and cnidarians, like sea anemone-like creatures, which we're going to talk about. The first animals lived in the oceans? True. Sponges like this one, they have a picture of one, are animals? True. True. Dinosaurs are among the first animals that lived on Earth? Oh, false. Right? The Cambrian explosion happened quickly, geologically, right? But it took 40 million years for it to happen. So 40 million years in our lifespan is really, really long, right? You can't even comprehend right, how long that is. The evolution of predation um, can speed up the pace of animal evolution. Yes, true. Scientists can trace the ancestry of every living thing back to the Burgess Shale. Every living thing, what, what else besides the Burgess? What else do we have on the planet? We have plants, we have fungi, right? So that's not true because there are other things that are living that are not animals. And then humans share a basic body plan with all mammals, reptiles, birds, and amphibians. True. And in the video, I do also talk about the genetic mechanism. So we talk about these master body plan genes, which are called Hox genes, which we see in um, regulating the development of, say, for example, an insect. And they're the exact same things that we see regulating the development of our bodies. Okay, so we have these homologous genes that haven't changed all that much. Okay, are there any questions about this idea? Had anybody heard of the Cambrian explosion before today? Just one person? Okay. So there is actually a famous scientist you might have heard of, an evolutionary biologist named Stephen Jay Gould. He was big in studying the Burgess Shale. And he's also did lots of movies and wrote lots of um, popular um, science books. Okay, so we're going to begin talking about the different animal phyla. So sponges are in the phylum porifera. And so porifera actually means pore bearing. So they have pores, and when we look at the structures, it's a little bit deceiving as to what we're looking at. This opening at the top of this particular sponge, this is called a barrel sponge, not all of them look like this, but this opening is not the mouth or the anus of the creature, right? It's not where they get the food, but rather there are pores in the side of the body that draw water through the, um, through the animal, and then the water comes back out. So the pores are actually all along the outside and um, a curse is created that draws water through the tissue or actually through the cells and into the inside and then out the top. So this is the why, why, the why of the way that they look, okay? So if we look at their characteristics, um, they lack symmetry. This one looks a little bit symmetric, looks like it might be radially symmetric, but other sponges are very asymmetrical looking. And if you go to an art store, you can sometimes find sponges for sale to use in painting. They're really quite expensive, the true sponges. The loofah sponge that you get, that you use on your body is actually not a sponge, it is a plant. So that's actually kind of the, the cellulose that's left after the plant. But you can find sponges in art supply stores and they oftentimes look very asymmetric. So they lack symmetry. They also lack tissues. 
which means that they have a cellular level of organization. So they're animals, but they do not have a nervous system. They do not have nervous tissue. They do not have muscular tissue, right? And so we tend to say that they are sessile as adults. Sessile means that they do not move. However, the larvae are capable of moving. So we say that they have mobile larvae. So the larvae are capable of moving around. And so that is how you could have dispersal <coughs> after reproduction happens. The larvae can swim off to a new environment, settle down, and become a non-moving adult. Okay? So they get food by filter feeding. But when you look at these sponges, some of them can get so large, for example, that you could actually swim into them. You can like move your body, you can put your whole body into this sponge, right? Some of them are really small. We actually also have freshwater sponges. Not all of them are marine. Um, when we look at this, we see that this, this is nutrients, right? These are nutrients that other organisms could use. So what, how might you uh, hypothesize that they protect themselves from predation. Would they, so like, would they have some sort of poison? Right. So I would predict that they have chemical predict uh, chemical protection. Right. So we are just now looking at all the different chemicals that sponges might produce. And when we talk about um, uh, pharmaceuticals, when we talk about medicines, oftentimes we talk about them coming from plants. And plants produce all kinds of biological active uh, chemicals that are used to protect them from being eaten, to protect them from herbivory, right? So this chemical protection means that these chemicals are biologically active, so they do stuff to organisms that try to eat the sponges, right? So what that means is, is that they might be important um, in medicine and they might actually be important pharmaceuticals. So this might be a reason, for example, to conserve sponge species because we really don't know a lot about the chemicals that are produced by sponges that might, we might be useful to humanity. Okay. okay. So when we look at the evolution of sponges, we see that there are some organisms like this one that are protozoans, which means they are single cells. And this single cell organism is called a coanoflagellate. And the reason why it's called this is it has a collar. So coano means collar. And flagella means that it has this little piece of cytoskeleton right here that allows it to uh, move and create a current. So when we look at um, the ancestor to the spon sponges, it might have looked something like this. So we have a colony of these individual cells that could come together to have a common um, uh, opening here. Actually, they don't have an opening, but they have a common stalk, which adheres them to the ground. And so we see that we have these types of, of organisms on the planet today, right? And um, these are not considered animals, however. So what makes the sponge uh, unique is, is that it is not just a colony of individuals, but rather it is multicellular. So the sponge has many cells and these cells cooperate in the reproduction of the whole individual. Okay. So let's look at the cells that are found in sponges. So we have what are called coanocytes. Whenever we see a site ending, that means that it is a cell. 
So for example, we have bone cells in our bones called osteocytes. Coanocytes are what are called collar cells. Okay. These line the inside of the sponge. They create a current. using the flagella, and they also capture food. So this collar um, is actually kind of like a sieve, like a net. So what happens is, is that these coanocytes that are on the inside of the sponge um, start to move their flagella, it draws the water in through the pores, and then food moves, or excuse me, water moves through the collar and then it captures it. And then what happens is, is that the food is taken up by the coanocyte and then it is distributed to other cells that are not coanocytes, but it gives that food, those nutrients to other cells that make up the sponge's body. Okay, so it captures food and it distributes it. And it does this via another type of specialized cell called an amoebocyte. So amoeba are capable of moving. This amoebocyte can pick up the food from the quantocyte and can carry it to other cells in the body. So instead of a circulatory system, these guys do not have a circulatory system. They just have cells that deliver nutrients to the other cells in the body. So this is an amoebocyte. Then we have what are called porocytes. So porocytes are the cells that make up the holes. So if I was to draw like a column shaped cell that had a hole through the center of it, right? So water is drawn in through the porocyte. So individual cells make up the pores on the body. Question? Yeah. So do the amoebocytes and the porocytes have the same DNA, DNA as the rest of the cells? Yes. So it starts out with an egg and sperm coming together. And so it's a single cell. And that single cell divides. And so the, um, yeah, so just like us, all of the cells come from a single cell. So yes, they all have the same genetic material. It's a good question. Yep. So it's not a colony. It's not different individuals. It's all the same individual. Oops. Okay, so let's look at the reproduction in the sponges. So they have a mechanism which is called asexual reproduction. And this is done under stress. So stress could be dehydration. So if the sponge is in a tide pool and the tide pool starts to dry out, or if it's a freshwater sponge and it's in a pond and the pond starts to dry up, dry out, right? So this is typically in when it dehydration occurs. So Asexual reproduction is the production of a package of amoebocytes. So the amoebocytes are packaged together and this package is called a gemule. And that's kind of a cool name because they look like little gems underneath the microscope. So they're called gemules. These amoebocytes are protected in this package um, and they can withstand dehydration so that when water is added to these dehydrated gemules, they'll burst open and each amoebocyte can then give rise to a new individual. So one amoebocyte 
can give rise to one new individual. Now this ability to do this where you have a single cell, it'd be like taking our liver cell, for example, and creating a whole new you out of it, right? This has a terminology and it's called totipotency. So think total potential. So one amoeba site has totipotency because it can produce a whole nother sponge. So this is asexual because these new sponges that would be produced are identical to genetically identical to the original sponge that produced the gemule. So then we have sexual reproduction. So this is defined by producing egg and sperm and producing offspring that are genetically different from the parents. So sponges are kind of interesting because they release the sperm into the water. So um, we'll put each sponge is both male and female. And there's a term for that, does anybody know? If it can produce both egg and sperm, it is called a hermaphrodite. Earthworms are also hermaphrodites. Okay. The sperm is released into the water. And supposedly you can see this, it's kind of like when they spawn. So they'll just kind of start to smoke, the, the sponges will, and they're just releasing the sperm into the water. And then the choanocytes capture the sperm. And perhaps, hopefully, it's probably the sperm, or maybe it's probably the sperm from a, another sponge, right? So choanocyte captures the sperm. Well, sperm could be food. But somehow they know the difference between the sperm of their same species and the sperm of a different species. So it's probably chemical, right? Sperm have protein receptors on their surface. So a clinocyte that captures the right type of sperm, right, would be able to save that sperm, it wouldn't digest it, and it transports the sperm to the egg that is inside the sponge. So the amoebocyte, transports sperm to the egg. And fertilization actually takes place inside. This is kind of weird because if you think about most creatures like coral and stuff, their fertilization takes place outside their body. But sponges, it's inside. Then the larvae develop. So the multicellular larvae is released into the water. Okay. And it is mobile because it has cilia. So cilia allow it to swim. Interestingly, in our embryonic development, we start out as a ball of cells that have cilia, and so the ball of cells can actually swim around inside the uterus before implantation, okay? But here, it's being released out into the water. And so if we look at a diagram that shows this multicellular larvae, this would be the multicellular larvae right here. So the cilia are just extensions of their cytoplasm, cytoskeleton actually, and that allows them to swim, swim and so they can swim to a new environment and settle down. Okay. This is actually a picture of a gemule. And so in, inside would be the amoebocytes. And this is what the gemules look like underneath the light microscope. So you can see that they look kind of pretty, they sparkle. 
The reason why they look like this and are in this network is, is that the skeleton of the sponge consists of spicules. So cells do not make up the skeleton. Spicules are not cellular. So they're just made of different types of organic molecules. So for example, this can be made of protein. So spicules can be protein. And this would be like the soft sponges. They can be made of silica. What is silica? Sand or glass. So these are called the glass sponges. So not all sponges are soft, right? They could also be made of calcium carbonate. Not actually, actually, I won't put that one down. We'll talk about that later. Calcium carbonate is a skeleton. Okay, so this one looks like maybe because it's shiny, it could be spicules made of silica. So the spicules help to protect the amoebocytes. And they also give the sponge its structure. So when the sponge dies, like when you get the sponge from, from the art supply store, that is actually composed of protein, and that would be a soft sponge. Okay, any questions about sponges before we move to the next phylum? Yes. Can a sponge sexually reproduce with itself? It could, yeah, so it probably can self fertilize. Yes. Do so you have cross fertilization and self fertilization? Interestingly, we'll talk about this when we get to other animals that do that commonly, but self fertilization can produce offspring that are a little bit different because you're recombining your own genetic material. So if I took like, if I was able to produce both egg and sperm and produce an offspring, it would be different from a clone from me. It would be genetically different than an exact clone. Yeah. Okay, so phy phylum Cnidaria. This has its name because it has cnidocytes. which are called stinging cells. Yes, so these are the jellyfish. So when we look at some characteristics of these organisms, they have radial symmetry. Which means that you can cut them in many different planes, many different halves, and get two identical halves. That's opposed to being bilaterally symmetric like we are. They also have tissues. And they typically would have two embryonic tissue layers. So they are said to be diploblastic. So two tissue layers. We are not diploblastic, we are triploblastic. So we have three tissue layers in our um, body that then give rise to the specialized tissues like muscle and bone and skin and nervous tissue. But the Nidarians only have two tissue layers. Okay. These organisms are carnivorous. And they can be mobile as adults. And this depends upon their body type. So we have two body types, two body types. So does anybody know what those two body types are called? We have one where the mouth is facing upward and we have tentacles. And so this is what is referred to as the polyp. So this is my mouth. So this is my polyp. 
the polyp tends to be sessile. Okay, but if you take this body plant and you flip it over and the mouth is down and the tentacles are hanging down, then we get what is called the medusa. So the medusa would look like with the tentacles hanging down. Okay? And then we have the mouth. This is the medusa. And this is mobile. So some uh, cnidarians are only polyps, and so therefore they're sessile. So that would be like the coral. Coral are polyps, so the coral. Some cnidarians are um, jellyfish, for example, would be mobile. Sometimes one species will, and one individual, will alternate between polyp and medusa. So some of their lifespan will be as a polyp, and then they'll produce the medusa, and then they'll be the medusa, and then the medusa reproduces and they become a polyp again. So these um, can be interchangeable within one life cycle of an individual. Okay. So if we look at the cnidocytes in a little bit more detail, the cnidocytes are a single cell that is capable of stinging. And so this is actually quite a really interesting cell specialization so that we have what is called the trigger. And inside the um, cnidocyte is a coiled barbed tube, which is called the nematocyst. So cnidocytes have nematocysts. So if you've ever been to an aquarium where they had a touch pool and, or if you've been to the tide pools, like on the Oregon coast, and you touch a sea anemone, it'll feel sticky, right? You're like, you're touching the arms. It's like, why is it so sticky? Right? Well, the reason why it's so sticky is, is that as you take your finger across its tentacle, you're triggering these and you're causing the nematocyst to fire. So this is super fast. So you hit the trigger and then this nematocyst is like a harpoon, it fires out. And the reason why you don't feel anything is, is that your skin is too thick, right? So your skin, the, the nematocyst cannot penetrate the surface of your skin. So you're just feeling it as it feels sticky, right? If you did the same thing to a jellyfish, it would hurt, right? You'd be like, ouch, 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 because you'd be getting stunned by the nematocyst on the jellyfish. Okay, so we're going to watch a little video, a little animation video that talks about why these organisms, which evolved very long time ago, before the Cambrian, right, are so good at surviving and um, are still around today. Yes, question? If you put your finger on one of them, would it be like hundreds of nematocysts or like 10 or like thousands of nematocysts? That's a good question. I'm not sure. I would say. We'll look at them when we look at the hydra. I would say that if you put your finger on, I think 20, that's what I would say. <laughs> Just from what I know looking underneath the microscope, yeah. Um, it can draw back in. So bees, unfortunately, have this really bad, the bee, when a bee, when a cologne, like a honeybee stings you, it dies. Because it, when it pulls out, it actually rips its, if you've ever taken, as a kid, I remember this experiment. You capture a bee and you pull the stinger out and like the guts come with it. It's pretty crazy, right? <laughs> Anybody's ever done that before. It's kind of, anyway, the guts will come out with it. But wasps can sting you many, many times. A bee can only sting you once, right? So I think that these, um, I don't think you're like destroying the nematocyst when you, when you rub your finger over it. It might destroy it if you got stung by a jellyfish and you pulled your finger away, 
I'm not uh, sure if the nematocyst would, I think it stays in your skin and probably just destroys that cell. So it would have to be replaced. Yeah. Some are longer than a blue whale. Others are barely larger than a grain of sand. One species unleashes one of the most deadly venoms on Earth. Another holds a secret that's behind some of the greatest breakthroughs in biology. They've inhabited the ocean for at least half a billion years, and they're still flourishing as the sea changes around them. Jellyfish are soft-bodied sea creatures that aren't really fish. They're part of a diverse team of gelatinous zooplankton, zooplankton being animals that drift in the ocean. There are more than a thousand species of jellyfish and many others that are often mistaken for them. A noted feature of jellyfish is a translucent bell made of a soft, delicate material called mesoglea. Sandwiched between two layers of skin, the mesoglea is more than 95% water held together by protein fibers. The jellyfish can contract and relax their bells to propel themselves. They don't have a brain or a spinal cord, but a neural net around the bell's inner margin forms a rudimentary nervous system that can sense the ocean's currents and the touch of other animals. Jellyfish don't have typical digestive systems either. These gelatinous carnivores consume plankton and other small sea creatures through a hole in the underside of their bells. The nutrients are absorbed by an inner layer of cells with waste excreted back through their mouths. But the jellyfish's relatively simple anatomy doesn't prevent it from having some remarkable abilities. One kind of box jellyfish has 24 eyes. Scientists think it can see color and form images within its simple nervous system. Four of its eyes are curved upward on stalks. This allows the jellyfish to peer through the surface of the water, looking for the canopy of the mangrove trees where it feeds. In fact, this may be one of the only creatures with a 360 degree view of its environment. The jellyfish's sting, which helps it capture prey and defend itself, is its most infamous calling card. In the jelly's epidermis, cells called nematocysts lie coiled like poisonous harpoons. When they're triggered by contact, they shoot with an explosive force. It exerts over 550 times the pressure of Mike Tyson's strongest punch to inject venom into the victim. Some jellyfish stings <laughs> barely tingle, but others cause severe skin damage. The venom of one box jellyfish can kill a human in under five minutes, making it one of the most potent poisons of any animal in the world. Other jellyfish superpowers are less lethal. One species of jellyfish glows green when it's agitated, mostly thanks to a biofluorescent compound called green fluorescent protein, or GFP. Scientists isolated the gene for GFP and figured out how to insert it into the DNA of other cells. There, it acts like a biochemical beacon, marking genetic modifications or revealing the path of critical molecules. Scientists have used the glow of GFP to watch cancer cells proliferate, track the development of Alzheimer's, and illuminate countless other biological processes. Developing the tools and techniques from GFP has netted three scientists a Nobel Prize in 2008 and another three in 2014. But it's jellyfish who may be the most successful organisms on Earth. Ancient fossils prove that jellyfish have inhabited the seas for at least 500 million years and maybe go back over 700 million. That's longer than any other multi-organ animal. And as other marine animals are struggling to survive in warmer and more acidic oceans, the jellyfish are thriving and perhaps getting even more numerous. It doesn't hurt that some can lay as many as 45,000 eggs in a single night. And there's some jellyfish whose survival strategy almost sounds like science fiction. 
When the immortal jellyfish is sick, aging, or under stress, its struggling cells can change their identity. The tiny bell and tentacles deteriorate and turn into an immature polyp that spawns brand new clones of the parent. As far as we know, these are the only animals who found a loophole when facing mortality. That's pretty sophisticated for species that are 95% water and predate the dinosaurs. Okay. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. So let's look at the major groups in this phylum. Actually, there was a couple, actually, I wanted to point out there was a couple of things as in the characteristics of the Nido or the Nidarians that I wanted to note is, is that they have no brain. Right? They have a nerve net. Okay. This is typical of radially symmetric organisms. They have no brain, but they have a nerve net. The other thing that they noted in this video is they have an incomplete digestive tract. So a complete digestive tract is where food travels through the digestive tract in one direction. It goes in the mouth and out the anus. So incomplete is they have only one opening. So they noted that food comes in and digestive waste comes out. So if you've ever um, seen, been at the aquarium, sometimes you see those big sea anemones and then all of a sudden they'll just spit something out, right? And it's because they've taken something in, they've eaten it, they've digested it, and they're just spitting the waste back out. So they have only one opening to their digestive system. Okay, so let's look at the major groups. So we're gonna talk about four different classes within the phylum Nidaria. So you're gonna need to know these classes. So the first one is Cubozoa. So that's Z-O-A, Cubozoa. So these are what are called the box jellies. Okay. So these are the box jellyfish. And um, these are the ones that have complex eyes. They're the only cnidarians that have this complex eye. Sea anemones and regular jellyfish do not have the complex eyes. They also have are very venomous. And I'm not sure why they're so venomous, but the um, organisms that feed upon fish have to get their venom, venom through the scales of the fish. So you can imagine that their nematocysts are gonna be able to easily penetrate our skin because we don't have the scales that fish do as protection. And so if they're feeding upon large fish, um, then you can imagine that they are going to be able to sting you. Okay, if they're feeding upon smaller organisms that are soft bodied, then like um, sea anemones, then they're not, okay? So complex size. Okay, so this one, the other one is the Cyphozoa. These are the true jellyfish. So most jellyfish that you see would be in the class Cyphozoa, not in Cubozoa. I'll show you some pictures of these in a second. Then we have the class Anthozoa. And antho refers to plants because plants have reproductive structures called anthers. So antho means that it's a plant-like animal. So what do you think this would be? Yes, so they would be polyps. So they would be like sea anemone. They would also be corals. 
And they also have things called sea lilies, which are kind of like polyps that are in a colony and they kind of look more like a plant than an animal. So those would be in the class Anthozoa. And then the last one are the Hydrozoa. And these include the Hydra, which we're gonna look at next week in lab. The Hydra is unique in that it is actually a freshwater cnidarian. It's microscopic, it's tiny, you can barely see it with your, with your eyes, but um, it is um, a, kind of a popular organism to use in the lab. This also, interestingly, includes the Portuguese man of war. This kind of looks like a um, jellyfish, but it's not. It's not a medusa. It's actually a colony of polyps. So it's not a medusa. Okay, so let's just look at some images of these. This is the hydra that we're gonna look at in um, lab. This is um, its ability to reproduce asexually is it just buds another individual off. Notice that it is a polyp, it tends to be sessile, but it can still move around. So like it can detach from the substrate and like float and then reattach, but it tends to be attached to some kind of substrate. This is also a hydrozoan. And in this particular example, this is one that alternates between a polyp and a medusa. So some of the um, polyps are the feeding polyps and some of them are reproductive. And so these actually just bud off um, little medusa that swim away and then produce egg and sperm. And so we'll look at this colony of hydrozoans in lab. If you've been to the Oregon coast recently, you might have seen these guys. Have you seen, has anybody seen these? Like last two times I've been to the Oregon coast, the beaches are covered in them. They're really, really actually kind of cool. You can pick them up. They don't seem to be able to sting you because I played with them extensively, right? They wash up onto the, to the um, shore and they are also hydrozoans. They have this, they're polyps, um, they have a sail. And that is also characteristic of a Portuguese man of war is, is that the wind blows over the surface of the water and it captures the sail. And so they actually kind of sail around the seas, right? Portuguese man of war are also very toxic. And so they have these long uh, colony of polyps here, lots of polyps um, that form the stinging part. And then part of the polyps form the stomach, right? This is just a, gas filled chamber that is um, made of cells, but it's, it's not the same thing as the Medusa. Okay, so this would be a coral. No, actually this is the sea anemone, excuse me. So this is the sea anemone. Here's the um, showing the stomach, right? Um, these guys can actually also move around in the aquarium. And so you might, find them on one side of the aquarium and then you come in the next day and they're on the other side of the aquarium. And so they kind of can flip so they can kind of go over onto their sides and they kind of do like a somersault type of movement um, from one side of the aquarium to the other. And then this would be the true jellyfish. And then this, oops. This would be the example of the box jelly or the cubozoa. And so this is a tiny little one, but you oftentimes see warnings on beaches for these guys because here you can see the eyes, right? So this is a small one, it's gonna grow bigger. And then these are the tentacles with the stinging cells, the cnidocytes that contain the nematocysts. So do you have to stay in like constant contact with them or is it just like one, one No, you don't have to. And then 
And I'm not sure why they're so toxic. That'd be an interesting thing to research. Um, generally, it's only the tentacles because that's how they capture their prey. So they, they swim up, right? And then they float down. And as they float down, their tentacles kind of come out. And what they're doing is they're trying to touch, right, their prey. And then they paralyze their prey. So the toxin causes the prey not to be able to move. And then they use their tentacles to draw the prey into the mouth. So it's a toxic that paralyzes the fish that prevents them from. So their tentacles act as Yes. Yep. Okay. So we'll stop there for today. And I'll see you in class tomorrow. Make sure that you bring your homework. And I'll collect it tomorrow. See you in lab tomorrow. No. You have questions? Thank <laughs> you.